Today for Forbes Instagram Live, Ask the Expert, we have Nate Kolbeck. He's the co-founder of 3D Brooklyn, which is located in Brooklyn, but it's really, it looks like it's in the middle of nowhere. To paint a picture for you, picture abandoned warehouses, buildings, and railroad uh, tracks, but in the middle of it all is your print shop, which is, um, you know, supporting the startup community and artist community there. Can you tell us a little bit about what a typical day is there first before coronavirus started? Yeah, normally we're, um, we're a design and prototyping firm who uses 3D printers to make early stage prototypes for our clients, mostly New York entrepreneurs who have a product idea. So we help them go from like back of the napkin sketch through a prototyping experience, get them ready to send off their designs to a factory or to kickstart it or whatever it may be. Nate, before you get into what you and your team have been up to um, after the outbreak, um, can you tell us about some of the cool products have all, that have already come out of your studio? Yeah, well, you know, um, we looked into making all sorts of things like ventilator parts seems like a really important thing we could make early on. But those designs are pretty complex and being worked on by groups all the way all around the world. So it didn't feel like something we could immediately jump into versus the face shield designs themselves was something we knew we could make at our studio here uh, without very much outside help in a sense. Like we can handle all the production here. So that's what we've been making, actually, and what's being made behind me here. Let me grab one for you real quick. Sure. Yeah, so just to further um, share more about 3D Brooklyn, it was opened in 2015. Nate comes from a film production background, while his co-founder, Will Hode, is actually from a, more of a fashion background. So um, it's really interesting how they've created this community for the Brooklyn and Queens startup and creative um, individuals why don't you show us what you've been so, creating so right so this is a shield right lots of people call it a mask but it's not it's a face shield it's just a physical barrier that the medical workers put in front of their face um right so this design is our version it's based off an open source design uh, by joseph prusa uh, but it's pretty straightforward this green and this red part are 3d printed which you can see happening behind me on these machines um a little piece of elastic and foam, and then a laser cut PET clear sheet here. Um, all assembled together makes, you know, a face shield and a pretty durable one at that from what we're hearing from medical workers, so. Great, you know, I was speaking with my colleague, Alex Knapp, he's the science editor here at Forbes, and he said the number one question is, what are the key materials? Um, what is the secret sauce that makes these a lot safer than other products you could buy off Amazon? Well, I don't know about that. I mean, it's not really about safety. It's about, from our perspective, we're not a medical supplier. You know, it's not like we've optimized this design to be competitive in a medical supply marketplace and been working on this and raising money for years at all. It's like it was, we reacted to what we saw, you, you know, the situation evolving here in New York, which is that all PPE is needed by everyone in the entire area. So the face shield is one part of a complete PPE set for doctors that are treating COVID patients. And this is like the first thing we did was call doctors and, and make sure that our face shield worked and could be accepted by medical facilities. So during that process, you know, we learned that it's a face shield, but it's also gloves N95 masks, which are being talked about a lot, um, gowns. These are all part of a, a normal collection of PPE that every doctor who treats a COVID patient in normal circumstances, would put on fresh, clean face shield, masks, blow in, do what they had to do with the patient, leave, and discard everything. And then the next time they go in, put a fresh one on their face. So if you do the quick math here in New York City, New York City would need 30 to 40 million of these right here during our peak. Um, so it's a huge, huge challenge. And, and, and in the early days, early days, like three, two, three, four weeks ago, it was clear that all these orders that had been placed in New York City hospitals or the city itself were TBD, we weeks out from expecting it to hit here. So we saw that our technology and doing a 3D printed face mask like this one, we could turn on in a couple of days and start delivering to hospitals, um, based, holding the line as much as we could, waiting for these larger suppliers to get their shipments here to New York or for local operations like FEMA 
um, is, is spinning up a facility to make 100,000 or so of these a, a week. Not as robust as, as this, but, you know, but that's still in development. Here we are, and we're about to hit our peak in a week. So we've been delivering for the last 10, 12 days, something like that, about 2,500 face shields. So that was our immediate goal. Like, let's start making as many of these as we can, as quick as we can. Yeah. Can you also tell us which hospitals, which clinics are you delivering to at the moment? Um, a lot. Yeah, uh, probably over 25 or 30 by now, but definitely the ones that are getting hit, right? Elmhurst Hospital, we've done multiple deliveries to. Brookdale, we've done multiple deliveries to. Um, my, I always pronounce this wrong, but the, that big hospital in South Brooklyn, Maya Menides. Mm -hmm. Maya, Maya Menides, that one. I we couldn't delivered. help you right now, but I know exactly what you're Please talking help. about. Please you know help. Yeah, exactly. That, that one. So they're getting rocked. And, you know, we've done multiple deliveries to those hospitals, among other ones, in the New York City area. So the five boroughs, but also New Jersey, you know, Westchester County, uh, a little bit into Long Island, because we're all in the same pool here, you know, and we're just filling requests as they come in um, for all hospitals and or medical workers here in the New York area. So we're mostly delivering, hand delivering to the hospital or to the medical workers home, and then they're bringing them in. Yeah, how could a medical worker get in touch with you if they're in dire need of PPE? They can go to a website. We stood up really quickly to, to um, intake orders. So it's covidsupplies.nyc, right? So covidsupplies.nyc. And if you are a medical worker and want to request some of these shields, please fill out our form there. Um, if you are a local producer or fabricator like us and have 3D printers and want to print some parts and send them to us, we will make sure they get in the hands of medical workers. You can also fill out a separate form through that website. And then the third, the third thing, if you're interested in supporting us financially because you know, you're, you're not in New York City, um, you can go to our GoFundMe, which you can access through covidsupplies.nyc while we raise funds to, to finance as many of these face shields as we can as quickly as possible. Sure, Nate, one of your volunteers actually texted me and said it was kind of um, an interesting way that you decided to pivot from a 3D print lab for startups and artists to becoming a full-fledged factory for face masks and other protective gear. Can you give me the behind the scenes? How did this come about? Yeah, I mean, the, the, the model is interesting, right? So with 3D printing in general, you know, light manufacturing, digital fabrications, it's, it's known by all these terms um, in the manufacturing industry. Um, and it has a lot of cons. Like we can't make a million $1 face shields, you know, one facility and then distribute it. It's the opposite of that, actually. So we think about it as like where everything's going towards a circular economy. So we at the design and prototyping firm leverage this technology because it's affordable, only costs a few hundred dollars for a machine. That one machine can print multiple prototypes in a day so we can iterate through our clients' design ideas. Um, but these machines are what we're experts at. We've used every type of 3D printer over the past five, six years, owned big industrial machines. So our expertise is in understanding how these machines work and how to design for them and in understanding the, the economic impacts of these technologies. So we knew that, all right, as a, as a studio four weeks ago, we had printers, right? So, so that capacity got us to a certain number, but we knew that we could purchase printers and have them delivered at our doorstep within a few days if we had the capital, right? So that's what we did. So we started the GoFundMe to raise the capital, ordered 20 new machines to double our production capacity. Um, and while we were you know, spinning up the GoFundMe and getting ready to scale up our production, um, we, we quickly went through a prototyping experience with doctors here in New York because we're experts at that as well, did prototyping using these technologies. So within two or three days, we had vetted the, the, the idea and began production and deliveries um, of, of, to hospital workers. So we are fast. We can, like in this context, we're kind of like a, a, a rapid manufacturing force here in New York City, like I said, to hold the lines for these bigger supplies and shipments to, to come here. So, but because the technology is so affordable and pretty simple, you can buy it on Amazon and have it delivered the next day. So we leverage that along with a community of other makers who have been so gracious in like donating 3D printer filament. Like our friends at 3D Print Life have sent us 300 kilos of filament for free because they want to help the cause and they don't have the capacity that we have, the expertise we have, but they make filament. 
Um, so we couldn't have done this without the support of other companies like us in the maker movement. And of course, like a team of volunteers of all of our friends, including Wisby, um, who have stepped up to do what they can. You know, it's really inspiring. Yeah, tell us about what artists like Wispy and Max Steiner, who are they? How did you team up with them? What an interesting partnership in these times. Yeah, well, our studio in, has been here, and technically we're in Ridgewood, Queens right now, but we're a couple blocks from Bushwick, like off the Jefferson stop. Um, so if you're in New York, you're probably familiar with the neighborhood. The neighborhood I'm live is, from Ridgewood right now. Woo-woo! <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> Represent. Um, yeah. So you know Bushwick. So Bushwick is like a super artist-friendly community. Like something like 1500 artists live and work in the neighborhood we even do this annual festival in the neighborhood um where everybody opens up their studios you, and you walk in and your mind's just blown at the like the talent in our community of sculptors um like wisby and like uh max steiner uh who we share a studio with is how we met max and max and jo- uh, wisby have been friends for a long time now um so this is our community so we work with a lot of artists to help them understand these technologies and go from making sculptures by hand to 3D scanning and 3D printing and casting. So where we do help our friends and and colleagues, but we just happen to be in this artist mecca in New York City. So our friends and our our clients are, a lot of them are artists and entrepreneurs. So that just happened to be our close network that we tapped. It must be strange to see your studio go from a maker of art and product prototypes what kind of products do you usually make what are you used to and what it's what, what's it like being this complete shift to a completely different set of products yeah um i mean we make all sorts of things you know we're experts at plastic prototyping so we prototype mostly with bioplastic and recycled plastics is an area of interest to us and we try to push our clients towards that direction try to manufacture here in the u.s if possible from recycled plastics if possible but because 3D printers and affordable 3D printers, like I was just talking about, primarily use plastic material, it's just, it makes sense for us to prototype like like uh, cosmetic products, right? Uh, uh, beauty packaging and uh, compacts and combs and brushes and lots of tools and, uh, you know, paintbrushes and accessories and things. So all over the map in, in terms of what markets, but lots of tools and makeup stuff and bottles and you know, uh, fashion accessories, sunglasses, things like that. You know? um, and then the, 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 to answer your other question, to be honest, it doesn't feel like that big of a departure from us. It feels like what we're doing now is what we know how to do. It is our expertise. And all we did was, was focus it in on, on the need here in New York City in this time and just trying to, to help where we can. So we already every day prototype for 3D, you know, and, and optimize designs for 3D printing. All we did was do that with a face shield. And, and, you know, we use these machines every day and will produce, for some of our clients, we'll produce several hundred units while they build their, their business. But, um, so that's all we're doing here. We're just, this just happens to be our wheelhouse and what we're experts at. So um, it doesn't feel too unusual except for the sense of urgency and, and the stakes are obviously higher than they've ever been. Ever been. Thank you. Um, I'm going to shift to audience questions at the moment. And the very first one is the perfect follow up to what we were just talking about. How many face masks can come out of 3D Brooklyn per day? Um, it's a good question. I and mean, it's front of mind for us all the time. Um, we should be able to get upwards of 300 to 350 with our current printers. We have 40 machines. But with this technology, because it's affordable, it's not that smart or reliable. So we're constantly troubleshooting. Uh, replacing parts, diagnosing, fixing. So it's a constant process of keeping the machines on. So right now we're, cons- we're consistently building up 250 to 300 a day, trying to get up to, you know, 2000 a week or so. Um, and really to sustain that is kind of the other side. So the daily output is key, but also how far, how long can we continue this? Because a lot of the challenge for groups like us who are smaller businesses we don't have money we like there's, there's no private equity investor backing us up throwing 100 grand at this idea we're completely reliant on other people like us throwing in and crowdfunding so when that fi- when that capital runs out shops like us are normally dead in the water we're lucky we we have we've got a lot of exposure and we've raised over forty thousand dollars now but if you look at gofundme most of these projects that are being done just like ours are severely undercapitalized. They're going to run through their four grand in three days if they're making stuff like we are, and then they stop. They're not making anything any, any longer. So 
Um, that's just what one, one thought, you know, for all you listeners out there is that there are groups like us in your city working. So you can find them on platforms like GoFundMe and they really do need the, the money. I mean, it's not like groups like us aren't selling these things. We are subsidizing. We're asking people who need shields if they can pay for them to pay for them because that allows more shields to get in the hands of people who can't, but it's just, you know, we're not, we're not a normal you know, medical supplier. We're not like, we're not a bit, this isn't our business. So our whole movement is reacting and, and giving away these things. So we really do need financial support um, from everybody out there. And Nate, correct me if I'm wrong, but a tip from one of your volunteers um, did inform me that the reason you decided to shift to this altogether was because you learned that so many um, private companies were hiking prices for face masks and PPE trying to capitalize on this current crisis. Is that true? Um, I mean, it always, ha it always happens, right? There's always people out there who are opportunistic and, and even, you know, and bright price gouging, but then there's also businesses that have employees that they need to pay that need to make a profit while they sell things. Um, so it wasn't really, and if you have to do that, that's totally under understandable, you know, but that model, so we could have done that right here. We have face shields, cool, who wants to buy them, reasonable profit, uh, these costs, just under five dollars to make we were thinking cool like for right now we're asking people who can afford it to pay four dollars to cover most of the cost or eight dollars so we can pay the volunteers but that's a traditional entrepreneurial way of thinking right cool product market market fit like how much can we charge for these things the the really the problem with that is that it's too slow it's too slow you're talking about hospitals you're working with the va and the feds and like by the time all the money and everything comes in we're through our peak and the ten thousand face shields that we could have made to make a true impact would not have been made. So, um, so it was less about the seeing other groups doing it the wrong way and more about us understanding that in order for us to be effective and help, we couldn't approach it in that same way. Um, and that the key is to get as many of these into as many medical workers' hands as possible, as quick as possible. So um, the traditional business selling these for profit routes just didn't, didn't make sense. Um, although, you know, other businesses have to do what they have to do. Yeah, this next question comes from someone who is probably maybe a similar entrepreneur like yourself who really wants to create and help and pitch in. So their question is, do you see you and um, I'm so sorry, <laughs> do you have to obtain any license or permissions to produce masks or ventilator parts? Um, I'm sure you do in a traditional context. This, again, it is not our area of expertise, but the... Um... The FDA has released guidelines with regards to 3D printing of PPE and other like ventilator parts. And basically what they're saying is that things like face shields that are just a physical barrier are fine, right? So mm -hmm. they've said, all right, this is fine. Um, this, this makes sense where they're a little bit reluctant and they were recommending not to use this for are things that deal with air and fluids because of how 3D printed parts are made there's little layer lines in them. And most of the parts are also hollow, right? So they're susceptible to germs getting stuck in the layer lines or anything like leaking in. So it's not an ideal process for making these things, but we're not in an ideal con situation here. You know, it's far from it. So um, so what we've done is, right, we've, we've sent them like samples to some hospitals so they could take a look at them, talk through and try to solve as many issues for the frontline workers have as possible like being able to clean and reuse these, you know, so all the parts can be cleaned except the three good ones because of that layering issue. Um, but, you know, we send a disclaimer that basically says, look, we're not a medical device supplier. These are, this is how these things are made. This is how these things were cleaned. Um, you know, do with it what you must, you know, it's de desperate times call for desperate measures. So we are hearing that, you know, unfortunately our medical workers in New York City are having to reuse all of their PPE. So ours is not unique in, in that sense. Right. Um, speaking of desperate times, desperate measures, what is the timeline for creating a single mask or a single part? What's that like? Um, yeah, I mean, there's a few steps, right? So um, the part, the two parts get printed, right? So the bottom piece, which holds this curve, right? So, you know, it starts to curve around the medical worker's face. Um, and this, this top part. I have a disassembled one. Um, sure. Yeah. And we can walk you through sort of the assembly line here too, if you'd like to, to Why don't see we, that. Yeah, I would love to see it. Why don't you do give us the uh, walking tour, please? Okay, great. So, Wisby, you want to be a cameraman? All right. So, 
these are some of our printers. Um, so these printers are printing two up visors. Can you see here? Hold yeah, uh, maybe tilt yeah. down a bit. Selfie, baby. All right, I got this. Um, so these are printing two up visors. It takes for each one of these parts plus a bottom takes about two hours okay. times 40 printers. If they're all running, that is, you can, you, you can see. So two, that's the longest part. Um, so those are the two 3D printed parts that Maxwell's working on behind me to clean and get ready um, to move down the assembly line here. So he's just, when you, when 3D printed parts come off the machines, there's extra plastic, there's stringiness, there's all these little things that need to be cleaned up really quick. So that's what he's doing. And then we throw um, foam. So just a little piece of foam onto the back, you know, for comfort there and a piece of elastic that wraps around the visor part around the back of the head so it can stay secure on your head. Okay. Then at this station, so after the, after the foam and the elastic is put onto the visor, like so, you grab the PETG laser cut face shield here and we snap, snap the bottom onto it, like you see here, right? Mm -hmm. There's a few holes to register and to secure the part yeah. and then and then the, the four holes here on the top snap in to the top of the visor. You can see there's some nubs here mm -hmm. on the edge um, to wrap around and hold it securely. And then we are at that station behind me. We're putting together stacks of 10. Um, and we are bringing them up here into our like area where they're queued up, right? Mm -hmm. Stacks of 10. So you can see the different colors. That's just... The nature of the beast with 3D printing. We have all sorts of material colors here for this application. For this application, we um, obviously don't care what the color is. So we're just cranking them out in all these fun colors. And, and hopefully um, that adds a little bit of a bright color into, I'm sure, like a pretty bleak, you know, um, situation here at the hospitals. And then, you know, so once they're queued up over there, we, we clean them, which is really important. Gloves, masks, all that. We clean them with an alcohol solution and then pack them into one of these boxes behind me. Um, and they get queued up and they go out. Usually we have a driver show up every day, at like three or four to pick up and deliver it to all the local hospitals. Um, and also just a quick peek behind me into our laser cutting room. There's Max Steiner back there running the laser. So he's cutting shields um, 15 at a time on, uh, on the laser cutter. So this type of machine, you just slide in a sheet of plastic um, it has this blue film over the top to protect it from getting burnt around the edges. And then once it's done, Max pulls out each of the parts and they look like this. Um, so we, we're, we're, you know, pulling off that blue film and obviously they need to be clear to be able to be seen through. So that's sort of the production line there. And we wow. have another, another 3D print room here with a lot of machines running. See in the background, another, another eight machines there. And then, you know, they're everywhere. Thank you. They've taken over. Fascinating. So many moving parts. For those who are just joining us, this is Nate Kolbeck. He's the co-founder of 3D Brooklyn. Yeah. And again, 3D Brooklyn is oh, literally yeah. Yeah. in the middle of Queens and Brooklyn, right on the border. It literally looks like it's in the middle of an an abandoned industrial valley. So it's so wonderful to know that underneath it all are these little hubs of um, creative communities coming together, especially during this time, creating PPE for frontline workers.